uh, you're here. Over the years, uh, many have uh, tried, as it were, to uh, clean up Christianity. Clean it up by uh, taking out the blood, after all, that's kind of a nasty, messy, gruesome element. But the reality is that you can't clean up Christianity in the sense of removing the blood. The very central reality of all of the human history, the human predicament is that God gave his son and he suffered and bled and died. True, as Mark emphasized, he didn't stay dead. He rose and he lives and he's coming again. But it will never be possible to remove the blood from Christianity. Apart from the blood that he shed, we are still in our sins. May we never be ashamed of what he did. Would you pray with me? It is, Father, all about you. And in its very essence, it's all about what Jesus did on the cross. Christmas focuses on the manger and the shepherds and the angels and yet looming over that tranquil and beautiful scene. The cross is still in the background. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you so loved the world that you gave him. Would you now anoint and empower your word in these moments? May it go forth in the power of your spirit and may it accomplish that which you intend in each of our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The uh, most recent issue of uh, a Christian church publication, it came this past week. Uh, it's uh, in type, the, the publication is called The Sword and the Staff. It was headlined by uh, the lead article, which was entitled, Life, Death, and Life Hereafter. As you might expect, the article uh, deals with the Bible's teachings on those three matters, life and death and eternity. Along similar lines, uh, I wish that you could have been here for our Thursday Bible study this past week. We've been studying for some months through the uh, Gospel of Matthew and uh, we have arrived at uh, some of the final days of Jesus' earthly life. Uh, we were looking at some of his teachings uh, about end times considerations, end times events, and uh, as part of his teaching along those lines, we were looking at the parable uh, that Jesus told about the ten maidens or the ten virgins. Uh, you're probably familiar with that parable. Uh, they were to be part of a wedding banquet and uh, Jesus said five of them were wise and five were foolish. But the final words, the way he closes that parable uh, are, is with these words, therefore keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. As we uh, thought about and examined those words, uh, uh, we uh, 
try to consider what's involved in keeping watch, what's involved in being ready either for Jesus' return or for your own death. What's involved in being ready and keeping watch? You might uh, protest and say, uh, now wait a minute, uh, preacher, this is the Christmas season. Christmas, after all, is just a little over two weeks away. Uh, uh, why are you talking about death? Uh, Christmas is all about life. After all, uh, uh, didn't the angels tell the shepherds uh, today in the town of, of David, a Savior has been born. Born talks about life, not death. That certainly is true. But uh, a close consideration of uh, the events associated with that first Christmas reveals uh, hanging in the background of those joyous events. The joy of a baby coming, uh, the joy of new life. Hanging in the background is an ominous cloud of death. Because shortly after the birth of Jesus, a number of boys ranging in age from infancy to two years were uh, killed, were slaughtered in and around Bethlehem. And uh, Jesus was merely a few days old when his mother and her husband Joseph took him uh, into the temple and there in the temple a God-fearing old man by the name of Simeon uh, uh, spoke uh, words to Mary, his mother, Jesus' mother. These words were, a sword will pierce your own soul too. By those words, he spoke a thinly veiled prophecy about the cross. So uh, even given the season, it's not inappropriate uh, that our text deals with issues of life and death. The Lord God uh, had just inspired Moses to compose the words of uh, a song a song that uh, for generations to come would serve as the Lord's witness against the sinful choices that his people would make. We then read, uh, beginning in verse 44 of chapter 32 of Deuteronomy, these words. Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 44. Moses came with Joshua, son of Nun, and spoke all the words of this song in the hearing of the people. When Moses finished reciting all these words to all Israel, he said to them, Take to heart all the words I have solemnly declared to you this day, so that you may command your children to obey carefully all the words of this law. They are not just idle words for you, they are your life. By them you will live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to possess. On that same day, the Lord told Moses, Go up into the Abarim range to Mount Nebo in Moab, across from Jericho, and view Canaan, the land I am giving the Israelites as their own possession. There on that mountain that you have climbed, you will die and be gathered to your people, just as your brother Aaron died on Mount Hor and was gathered to his people. This is because both of you broke faith with me in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah, Meribah Kadesh in the desert of Zin, and because you did not uphold my holiness among the Israelites. Therefore you will see the land only from a distance. You will not enter the land I am giving to the people of Israel. Ever since the day that God fashioned man uh, in his own image out of the dust of the earth, and as part of that image uh, gave man the ability to communicate, to speak, 
Ever since that day, there has never been a shortage of words. There certainly was not a shortage of words in Moses' community. Can you imagine a couple of million people, uh, the number of words exchanged in any given day? Around the campfires, as they did the dishes, uh, as they uh, watched over their flocks. But the fact is that all conversation, all words are not of equal value, of equal importance. The words uh, that Moses had been relating to the people were of extreme significance. Did you notice what he said? He emphasized, he said, uh, I have solemnly declared these words to you. They are not just idle words. The people might forget this morning's conversation with a neighbor but they dare not ignore or forget all the words that Moses had declared. Moses declared that these were the very words of God and as such they would be life for the people. If the people would live if they would live life in a meaningful way, if they would live long and productive lives, they must pay attention to, uh, indeed, the text says, take to heart. In other words, internalize the words of God. Make them a part of, their very, of the very core of their beings. But they must, it's not just a matter of uh, uh, internalizing them. Moses says, also, you obey carefully all these words. They are to guide your actions, your lives on a day-to-day -day basis. And the word of God was not to be merely for those who would hear and understand uh, what Moses said on that particular day. These words were so critical so vital, so essential, that the people were to be certain that uh, they would teach the next generation so that they too would know and obey. The bottom line was that whether these people would experience all the abundance of the promised land whether they would experience all that God was offering them, whether they would live long, productive lives in that land would depend on one thing alone, what they would do with what God said, with His Word. In fact, the uh, dire consequences of treating lightly the Word of God uh, were underscored in the remainder of the text. Did you notice? Although the events had taken place uh, several years previously, the details were as vivid in Moses' mind as though they had just happened yesterday. It was in the wilderness. The people uh, complained, they quarreled against Moses, against Aaron, and these were their words. There's no water to drink. And so, uh, out of uh, desperation, out of frustration, Moses and Aaron fell face down before the Lord, and they asked him, what are we to do? The Lord uh, spoke words, and these are found in the 20th chapter of Numbers, but the Lord spoke to them. Listen to what he says. Take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community, so they and their livestock can drink. But then, listen to what actually took place. 
verse 9 of chapter 20 of Numbers. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. Sounds good. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses <coughs> said to them, Listen, you rebels, must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses raised his arm and struck the rock twice. With his staff, water gushed out in the community and their livestock drank. It really did seem to be no big deal. After all, Moses did speak to the rock. But when he spoke, he said, must we bring? And Moses didn't just speak to the rock. He struck the rock twice with his staff. No big deal, right? But listen to God's assessment <coughs> for Moses and Aaron treating lightly what God had said, treating lightly his word. Verse 12 of chapter 20 of Numbers. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. And so here they are. Some years later, we're back to the text, and Moses has just declared that if the people will take to heart the words of God and obey them, they will experience life, full and uh, fruitful life. But on that same day, Moses was to go up onto the mountain, and he himself would die. Aaron had already died previously. Moses would die that same day for no reason other than that he had treated lightly, if you will, made idle words of the word of the living God. How God uh, looked at and evaluated their disregard for his word is expressed in these words, you broke faith with me, you did not uphold my holiness. In fact, uh, in the face uh, of God's promise of life, the ominous cloud of death was not absent. The nation could live if they would consider as holy and take to heart and obey carefully the words of God. Moses would die because he had broken faith. He had brought down God's holiness by ignoring, by treating lightly the words of God. As demonstrated in uh, this incident in the life of Moses, in no aspect of life is it more important, more vital to take to heart and obey the words of God than in the matters of life, death, and eternity. Common uh, thoughts on how to be certain about eternity uh, include some of these. Uh, we're all going to the same place. Uh, on our death, all paths lead to the same place. Or, or uh, if you're good enough, you don't have to worry about eternity. If uh, the good in your life outweighs the bad, then you don't have to be concerned about eternity. Or, or uh, recently this has... Uh, in the last decade, this teaching has become quite popular. Uh, after all, there is no eternal punishment. There is uh, 
uh, no place called hell. So there's no need to be really concerned about eternity. <coughs> Those are common uh, evaluations of uh, eternity that uh, our culture holds. We need to hear again the words uh, of God when he says, uh, Multitudes who sleep in the dust of the earth will awake, some to everlasting life, others to shame and everlasting contempt. Daniel chapter two, 12, verse 2. We need to hear again uh, the words of Lord Jesus when he says, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. We need to uh, hear Jesus say once again, I am the gate for the sheep. Whoever enters through me will be saved. And we need to hear him say again, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Eternity is real. Every one of us will spend uh, eternity in one place or the other, either heaven or hell. Eternity is forever and ever. And the only determining factor in where any of us or any of our loved ones will spend eternity is, what do we do with Jesus? He died on the cross to pay the penalty for the sins of every single person. He rose on the third day to give uh, salvation and eternal life. <clears throat> but that leaves us with a uh, question. How does one access uh, that life that God offers in his word? What does God say uh, is involved in coming to salvation? Uh, the most common response that uh, you will hear to that question is, uh, pray the sinner's prayer. Ask Jesus into your heart. Do you realize the sinner's prayer is never once mentioned in the Word of God. Certainly prayer is very important in coming to faith and salvation, but it's only a part to various individuals desiring salvation. We find these responses in the Word of God. Jesus himself says, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent, John 6, verse 29. So faith, believing in Jesus, is essential. We read in Romans chapter 10, verses 8 and 9, the word of faith we are proclaiming, that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. According to that uh, word of God, belief, faith, is certainly essential, but also is confession, confessing in a public sense with your mouth. In response to that question, in the second chapter of the book of Acts, we read these words, uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
Acts chapter 2, verse 38. So uh, repentance is necessary. A change of mind leading to a change of actions. And baptism, water baptism, is necessary. And one other that I would call your attention to from the 22nd chapter of the book of Acts. A man is told, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away. Calling on his name. Calling on his name. Prayer. Prayer is essential. But be baptized the baptism also. No one today is authorized to delete any of these scriptural directives that God has given in His Word. Nor is anyone authorized to add any additional directives than what God has spoken in His Word. <coughs> Moses might have said, I didn't really think it would hurt anything. After all, I spoke to the rock. Uh, I just struck it a little bit. But for that uh, breach of the Word of God, Moses paid with his life. He died without entering the Promised Land. And so none of us today, not, I, not myself or anyone, has any license to say when God's Word says this is what's involved in coming to salvation, None of us has any license to uh, say, uh, well, that's not important. That particular aspect isn't important. Each of us needs to hear once again Moses solemnly declare, the words of God are not merely idle words, they are words of life. And the Word of God lifts up Jesus and the cross as the only way to access life and to escape death. For every uh, one of us, and for those that we love and care about, this Christmas season, the most important consideration that uh, we could ever have is this. Am I ready to live? Am I prepared to die? The words of God uh, make clear how a person can answer in the affirmative, how a person can be prepared. I want to close... Uh, this time with uh, an account that vividly illustrates the importance of heeding God's words in order to be prepared. This came just a few days ago. It was in a newsletter from the Bycrofts in Sri Lanka. Listen to what they write. This uh, is entitled, Several Funerals. <coughs> this past month has been busy with funerals. None were from our churches, but they did involve family members. One was Shanti's cousin's husband. He was an OBGYN doctor and had been very helpful to us when Shanti and I were first married with wedding expenses, as well as over the years with free medical visits. Complications from a surgery and infections brought about his death. The saddest part was that he did not know Christ. Then Shanti's uncle's wife died unexpectedly. She had been at the hospital praying for and sharing Christ with cancer patients the evening before. The morning of her death, she was up, fixed breakfast for the family, went to take her bath, and dropped dead, apparently uh, from a heart attack. 
Her funeral was attended by over 500 people, the most I think I've ever seen at a funeral, which was a testimony to how many people she had impact, impacted over the years. What a difference there was in these two funerals. One was very sad. People were openly distraught. And you could actually see the despair in their faces. The other, while there was certainly grief at her passing, there was also a calmness and a comfort in the faces of the family. The difference was in knowing she was in Christ and was now at rest in heaven. What a difference being prepared to meet God makes when this life is over. This is why we are here sharing the gospel we want people to know Jesus Christ so that when this life is past, there is assurance that heaven awaits them. Steve said, that's why we're here, sharing the gospel, helping people to be prepared in the way that the word of God, the gospel, declares they need to be prepared. Do you? need to prepare this day? Does someone you love need to prepare this day? May each of us and those that we love and care for heed and uh, may we who uh, by God's grace, have made preparation. May we declare to those that we love God's way for being prepared, what He reveals in His Word. May we, and through our prayers and our efforts and our words, those that we love be prepared for life our hymn of decision is number 342 just as I am if you're not prepared for life if you're